بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نرحب بكم مرة أخرى مع جلسة جديدة Welcome من you again in this uh, new session of our conference and uh, this time we will discuss the situations and policies of the Gulf countries towards the crisis. We have researchers and specialists who will cover a number of the GCC countries and their situations towards the current crisis to save some time and to give enough time to every speaker. We will start with Dr. Abdullah Baboud, the director of the Gulf Studies Center at Qatar University. He was the director at Cambridge University of the Gulf Centers, Masters in Business Administration, in International Relations, and PhD in Political Economy from Cambridge University. You have 20 minutes, Dr. Abdullah. He will talk about the Omani situation towards the crisis, motives, and challenges. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Good afternoon to every one of you here. My topic, as mentioned by a doctor, is the Omani situation towards the Gulf crisis. As you know, this crisis has been taken everyone, and it was an unprecedented crisis when it comes to the time, to the volume of escalation, to the levels, and to the ways of dealing with such a crisis. And it's for the first time to have such a crisis in the Gulf region. We have seen other uh, problems before, but this crisis is really deep and unprecedented on all levels officially, and on the level of uh, the peoples, and uh, even when it comes to the regimes. So even the media has been involved. And as uh, you have seen, the social media is uh, playing a role that uh, overcome every limit. So when it comes to Oman, and we need to go through a reading to the Omani situation. I think Oman has a situation that is not far away from the Omani situations regarding any previous problems or away from its uh, fixed foreign policies that call for sorting out the disputes and conflicts via dialogue and to get ourselves away from all the reasons that might create troubles and problems for the region and for the region's country and uh, to keep uh, self away to be partial uh, and uh, to be away from the conflicts this is the official situation of Oman, no interference in other countries' home affairs, as Oman will never allow anyone to interfere in its own affairs. Oman always look for peace uh, in the region. And we have uh, so many examples to this. We will talk about these examples later. The Omani situation, as you all know, Iman, Oman has uh, friendship relations with all the GCC countries. They are all uh, sisterly countries. The relation between Qatar and Oman used to be exceptional all over history. Very exceptional relations between Qatar and Oman. Very distinguished relations between the two countries, even at early 70s when we witness the change of Oman, when Oman doesn't have schools and uh, universities, Qatar used to host the Omani students and support them. My generation have uh, 
graduated from the universities and the schools of Qatar. So we have such a popular relation and uh, official good relations between our both countries, very distinguished relations. Everyone in Oman has been shocked when they knew about this crisis. It was a shock worldwide. It was not expected. But in Oman, the shock was on the uh, official level, and the people of Oman has been shocked because they don't agree that a Gulf state like Qatar to be in such a critical situation. The Omani people also see the accusations to Qatar and the demands by the blockading countries are not realistic. Sorting out this problem might be only through dialogue and through uh, getting to the table, discussing everything between brothers in the Gulf Cooperation Council. And uh, there are many people who believe that there is no need at all to such a political conflict and uh, dispute uh, over the media. There are many people who believe that we need to avoid everything that will create a real crisis in the region on all levels, the political level, the, the strategic level, or to create a problem to the Gulf Cooperation Council. As you all know, the Gulf Cooperation Council is an original establishment, as we used to define it. And uh, this organization, uh, Gulf organization, despite uh, lacking so many things, but still it's the organization, the only organization in the Arab region that has a sort of a presence and that uh, works in uh, a sort of efficiency, not fully efficiency, but uh, this is the way it is. And I'm sorry to say that even the Arab organization and the Arab League itself is not vital at all. And uh, the Gulf region is witnessing uh, a very difficult period economically, as you all know. We have an economic problem because of the uh, decreasing oil prices. That has led to problems with the budgets of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. And uh, we have never thought before that we will have a political problem because the region needs cooperation and integration and real sustainable development. <coughs> the peoples of the Gulf always look for this integration. The uh, region is facing an economic problem and a political problem, and the region area is uh, is really witnessing heat, if I could say. We used to live in luxury, and uh, our luxurious life was clear. But around us, the region is in a problematic situation. See Iraq, see Yemen, see Somalia, Libya, and other Arab countries uh, are some of Arab countries are really a big failure. Some of Arab countries are on the way to a big failure. And the Gulf Cooperation Council countries have to support these countries to get up again, particularly with the economic resources that we have in the Gulf. Uh, the least thing that we can see uh, a problem between the Gulf Cooperation Council countries and uh, to be taken away from the path of real development needed, away from economic development that needed, and uh, to help the neighboring countries. So I just want, sorry to say again that the blockade or the siege, I don't know what we call it, but this blockade or this siege hits the soul, the spirit of the Gulf Cooperation Council. As you know, the Gulf Cooperation Council is a regional organization, and all regional organizations are organizations based on law and regulations. And the blockade or the siege hits 
really and deeply the 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 agreements between the GCC countries, the soul and the spirit of the organization. You have to know that there are so many agreements signed by the Gulf Cooperation countries, including the joint Gulf market that calls for the freedom of movement of capital, individuals, and goods, in addition to other uh, political uh, agreements. The Gulf Cooperation Council countries have formed a political and security uh, uh, group that none of these countries can even imagine uh, an aggression from a neighboring country. And uh, the consequences of this crisis, as I said, has uh, knocked all the previous agreements. No freedom of movement now, no freedom of capital movement, of goods movement, in addition to the humanitarian uh, problem suffered by the peoples of uh, the Gulf because there are tribes uh, who used to have good relations. You can find a family that includes a Saudi, Kuwaiti, uh, an Emirati, and Qatari, and the Bahraini. So, so many families have suffered from this on the humanitarian level. And this blockade and this siege has uh, deeply affected the economic, the social, and the political domains of the GCC countries. Don't forget that the GCC countries, through the organization, has have strategic dialogues with uh, so many countries and powers, including uh, America, China, the European Union, and uh, today, the credibility, the credibility of the organization of the GCC has been absent now. How can you go into a dialogue as a group this within the uh, uh, differences amongst your countries? I'll give you an example. We had the Arab Gulf European dialogue. <coughs> Our ambassador in, Bro in Brussels is from Qatar, and he cannot talk or even deal with his other uh, colleagues from the Gulf. So how can we have a dialogue with the regional organizations, with the big regional organization? It's quite difficult. My understanding and my reading to the Omani position is the Gulf Cooperation Council is quite important to everyone. Yes, uh, it has been criticized. I mean the organization, but we have gained a lot and we have had so many benefits and we need to build uh, on these uh, benefits and gains. We need not to destroy the GCC because of some troubles or problems, any differences in our viewpoints must be sorted out in a political way through dialogue between the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Even the decision was not taken within the organization. The decision was taken away from the Gulf Cooperation Council. So how, how can you sign uh, uh, free trade zones agreement, uh, common uh, uh, Gulf market agreement, and then you had other decisions with a sisterly country like Egypt, which is not Egypt is not a member of the GCC. So how can we sign an agreement with Egypt away from the GCC organization? The GCC now has to be reviewed, the objectives have to be reviewed. Is it going to continue? This will be clear through the coming GCC summit. Uh, as you also know, the crisis has uh, achieved a lot of the economic benefits for Oman. Trade between Oman and Qatar has increased according to the reports like 2,000 percent because Qatar needs a lot of goods and products 
and construction materials, food. So Oman opened its uh, air and uh, navy sphere to Qatar, and we had a commercial agreement, trade agreement. Investment has been always there, and we have signed an agreement to establish Karwa Buses Corporation that worth $200 million in Oman and uh, other things in the field of construction. This might reach to $400 million. We have also uh, commerce and trade, as I said, that has uh, flourished. Uh, and we have now products coming from Oman to meet uh, the current needs of Qatar. But this has been a result to this uh, crisis. Normally, it was like 10%, uh, uh, but now it has flourished because of the crisis. So <coughs> there is a sort of expansion in this regard. But despite everything, despite the benefits gained by Oman due to this crisis, as some other countries have, because in all, in every crisis we have people who make benefits. Oman always see the biggest benefit must not come from a crisis. The biggest benefit must come through stability in the region, through security in the region, keeping security, increasing cooperation, increasing regional integration. This will benefit all parties, and this will increase the volume of benefits for the organization. This will enable us to defeat everything else. This will increase our unity. You might ask why our man is enthusiastic towards the GCC, why our man has rejected uh, to be part of the unified currency or to be a member of the the Gulf uh, Union declared by King Abdullah in 2013-2014. Here we can say Oman is always believing in taking things gradually. Oman always believe in increasing integration and cooperation gradually, step by step, in order to reach ultimately this unity. But the main and uh, the basics <coughs> elements of integration must go through steps. We need not to burn these steps. We should have a free <coughs> market, and uh, it should also develop also to a uh, unified customs and tariff, common market, unified currency, common currency, uh, economic unity, and accordingly, we will reach the political unity. Unfortunately, the concept of Gulf uh, cooperation, as we see in Oman, is, uh, although it is significant and it is the main objective of such integration and cooperation, however, it comes a little bit earlier. It's premature because one of the most important significant steps to achieve such integration has not been completed yet. So how come we can just overtaking the steps or uh, over ambitious to achieve high level of ambition and high level of cooperation and integration on the GCC while we don't have the proper basics or the proper foundation for this? This might lead to a complete fall down and uh, collapse of such uh, efforts. So we should have uh, an agreement on how to handle such uh, coalition or also Oman sees that the process should be done gradually and we shouldn't give our people high expectations that we couldn't uh, meet 
So, this is the Omani opinion toward this uh, Gulf coalition. As for the Gulf currency, actually, there w we didn't have proper standards for the unified Gulf currency uh, because the scope of the Omani economy and it has other uh, uh, aspects for their own economy. In the meantime, uh, the Omani situation towards, I still have two minutes, the Omani situation towards the current Gulf crisis is that it's uh, not a real crisis. It's a fabricated one, and it should be solved immediately as soon as possible, because the longer it takes, there will be more complication and consequences, and might end up in a more complex uh, situation, and it might have severe impact on the states of the region that couldn't be changed. For example, Qatar might go to Iran, might have strong relations with Turkey, or uh, we have seen that uh, some Turkish troops have uh, come to the uh, area, so there will, be, be, there will be other consequences in the Gulf area. So it is not easy to solve the problem in such a hard situation. The longer the crisis takes, the problems will be more complicated. Oman would like to be the key player in such, uh, Kuwait as well would like to be the key players in solving this crisis. In brief, there is a Kuwaiti rule recommended and uh, we should thank them for their efforts. Her, His Highness, the Prince of the State of Kuwait, has played a significant role in and exerted a lot of efforts. Oman doesn't want to replace the Kuwaiti role in solving the Gulf crisis. However, Oman supports the efforts exerted by Kuwait to solve the crisis. At the end of my speech, if you allow me, Oman and other countries should ask and should inquire if such crisis that has been invented and fabricated with Qatar from nowhere with some of the neighboring countries. If such a crisis has come with any, without any introductions and such false accusations and that Qatar has Qatari uh, rela uh, relations with Iran, most definitely Kuwait has relations with Iran. Oman has relations with Iran. Will there be other actions taken against Oman or Kuwait because of such false accusations, will they pay the price later on? It is evidently clear that uh, there is a concept of control with some countries to control other countries and they, have, they would like to have control over decision making or unified decisions taken by the GCC. This is very difficult to achieve. Even the European Union, we find that in their policies, there is common policies. However, they have different opinions to, on the European living. And this union, we all know that it has reached the very developed stages of integration. So, however, the situation in the Gulf states is not that mature yet. How come such one of the states uh, just attacks uh, the other neighbor states on false grounds and accusations uh, in order to control such uh, states and control the decision makers? So GCC should put in their minds that different opinions and various policies give them more strength and power, give them more space to move and to compete and uh, give them dynamics uh, other than control or uh, taking over other states by other. Sociopolitically, you know, the, 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 the Emirates were actually a country that then with that kind of vision saw the, the Arab Spring as one of the most threatening things that could potentially happen to the Arab world. MBZ, as someone who's driven by paranoia, you know, I've, I've, and I've, I've got a lot of interesting accounts from people who know him personally, He's a man who has some psychosis. You know, he is paranoid even as an individual. Um, and same, the same is true for MBS, MBS Mohammed bin Salman, to a, to a lesser degree. Um, so he's a man um, who sees dissidents as an absolute threat. He sees the Arab Spring as chaos because if he, he's someone who believes in the strong state, and the Arab Spring was all about getting rid of regimes and disintegrating social politics. 
Um, and he sees it as anarchy, and most importantly, the rise of non-state actors. The most important thing, and this is, they, it's not just that they have a problem with political Islam. They have a problem with non-state actors they cannot control. So, um, in, in a way, if you look at what they're doing in Libya, in Libya, they are, they are actually working on the ground with Salafi movements, Salafi jihadists. They same they do in Yemen. So how does that go, um, you know, hand in, how does that go in hand in hand with political Islam? The simple thing with MBZ is, um, is Salafia can be controlled. The Salafia are somewhat attached to, you know, to the, to the ulama in Saudi Arabia. They, they are somewhat controllable. The Ikhwan are an organization that you cannot control. And, you know, the, the Ikhwan have a long history, and, and Al-Islah has a long history in the, in the UAE. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Um, but the Ikhwan were always a, a movement that was outside of sta the reach of the state. They were an organism in itself, thereby a threat. Um, all right, okay. So in the region, this guy is trying to pursue very much a neoconservative um, approach, a neoconservative approach that Saudi has now um, um, embraced. You know, security is over liberty. You know, it's strengthening autocratic regimes, zero tolerance for any form of dissidence, um, and, and fear that dissidence and opposition might eventually lead to insurgency. It's very much a paranoid vision. And they're obsessed with terrorism. And terrorism is anything that is a non-state actor that opposes the status quo. And then this is why, you know, now see what the Qataris are doing. They're working via non-state actors, thereby they are a ma major threat to that kind of vision. They believe also in the conveyor belt theory, as many people in DC do as well, thinking that if you are an Islamist, you're just two steps away from becoming an Al Qaeda. Um, so they, 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 believe, they, they, have, they support state sovereignty and strong authoritarian governance. Their ideal, ideal partners that MBZ is grooming is Haftar in Libya, who is a strongman, is Sisi in Egypt, who is a dictator, uh, Saleh in Yemen, who is an absolute genius that he came back on top over the last uh, couple of days. Um, Mohammed bin Salman has been one of the people who followed MBZ's vision for a very long time, their personal friends. Now the argument is that MBS has gained so much power in Saudi that he's no longer being played by MBZ, but he's now able to play MBZ. Again, different discussion. And the other one is Netanyahu in Israel. Netanyahu in Israel has a very similar vision of how the Arab works are supposed to look like, one based on authoritarian stability, which is obviously a myth. Now, in conclusion, the crisis is as much about values and probably even more over values and worldviews than over actual interests. And the UAE and Qatar have developed visions which are, an, which are an antithesis to Saudi Arabia, but Saudi has now embraced the Emirati position. The Qataris are very idealistic in many ways, and, you know, but in, I think in the long run, Qatar's vision is the one which will be more sustainable. More aggression, more repression, more authoritarianism, as we see that now in, in, in Libya and in Syria and in, 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 in Egypt, will eventually create more dissidents and will create another wave of, of revolution, revolution and insurgency. That, that is, that is uh, I think, um, where this is going to go. So I think the country approach is probably one which is more sustainable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Greg. Our last speaker is Omar Kareem. Omar Kareem has a PhD in political sciences, international studies from Birmingham University. And he concentrates on the Saudi foreign policies and the development of the Saudi foreign policies since uh, King Salman took the power in Saudi Arabia inside the kingdom. He also has researches on national research in the Middle East and the Saudi-Iranian relations, the Syrian dispute, and Turkey in the Middle East, the role of Pakistan. So he has a lot of principles regarding the situation in uh, and around this region. Dr. Omar, Amamaka, Ishruna, Dakika, put in mind that uh, we are approaching the launch time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for and thank you for the organizers for inviting me here. So uh, I will just try to. 
briefly give uh, an outline of Saudi Qatari relationship since the time of the second Saudi state. And uh, as yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but the day before, Professor Noneman was saying that, uh, that Saudi Arabia has always acted as a hegemon in the region. And uh, this has been there when Saudi Arabia emerged as a nation state but this character has been very much there in the past, even in the time of the second Saudi state or the first Saudi state. So when I was writing the, the, the paper, I found references that in 1851, uh, Amir Faisal of, uh, uh, of the second Saudi state, he wrote a letter to the then Qatari Amir that, uh, okay, fine, you're uh, doing a good job in Qatar, but uh, uh, can you just uh, collect the zakat in my name? which was essentially an intimidation attempt uh, uh, and uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind, kind of a maneuver to, 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 to show that the Saudi hegemony is very much uh, politically and religiously there in, in the Gulf region. So uh, in that context, uh, uh, the, the, the Qatari emirs have been shaping out their policies, security policies, so they uh, had a security arrangement with the Ottomans, and uh, after World War I, when the Ottomans left, uh, the Brits um, were the new uh, security uh, partners. And uh, so in this manner, they were trying to balance out against uh, their, uh, their neighbor, which was much powerful and bigger in size and resources, and also uh, quite aggressive in its intentions. Um, in, uh, after getting independence, Qatar basically had uh, a difficult choice to make that how to move forward now because uh, security guarantor Britain has left and uh, Saudi Arabia is now a practical reality. And it is also interesting that at, th at that time, Saudis were themselves engaged in their own problems. Uh, they, they, they had uh, the issue of um, an, uh, at before an ascendant Egypt, and then um, afterwards uh, the I issue with Iran. Of course, the Iran-Iraq war was a major um, was a was a major motivation for the formation of the GCC states. So somehow this this kind of arrangement continued, but Qatar generally followed um, foreign policy stance, and he, uh, broadly GCC countries followed a foreign policy stance which was relatively. Uh, close to each other. Uh, the change uh, or the fracture happened uh, during, uh, uh, after the um, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait because that uh, dawned on the Qatari ruling elite, especially Sheikh, uh, uh, the former Amir, uh, Sheikh Hamad bin um, Khalifa, that, who then was a crown prince, that the Saudis cannot defend even themselves. They are, they are depending on the Americans for their security. So uh, how can we depend upon them as kind of a regional hegemon or as kind of a security um, guarantor or regional policeman? So why shouldn't we just uh, go directly into a relationship with the United States? So there, this interesting trend which an author writes as uh, uh, quitting bandwagoning uh, in, in pursuit of relative autonomy that was opted by uh, the Qatari new leadership. And this was, um, in a way, combined with uh, a, an independent foreign policy approach. So for this uh, foreign policy approach, uh, Qatar tried to uh, project its soft power. It created uh, its image as a mediator, as a uh, a facilitator um, in terms of negotiations in regional conflicts, uh, which uh, has been described as uh, uh, resulting in giving Qatar strategic leverage in the form of long-standing uh, mutual, long-standing long mutual interdependencies, which, as uh, Professor Andreas said, that uh, it was kind of a social liberalization model. I will put it that Qatar. Um, was probably on a very large scale an, a localized neoliberal project. And this was very much uh, the model which uh, Sheikh Hamad uh, followed with. 
So now let's move towards the Saudis and see what were they going through and what were their problems, their especially local realities. <coughs> After the Kuwait war, there were uh, protests in Saudi Arabia by uh, the Sahwa movement, the political Islamists, and uh, they created uh, quite, a, quite a potent political problem. And then all these leaders like uh, Salman al awda <coughs> Safar al-Hawali, and uh, all of those, they were arrested and uh, released uh, after years. So this gradually, we, we can see like where the potential threat is coming for the Saudis or in, the, in perception of Saudi rulers, where the potential threat is. It is uh, political Islamists. And now as you turn uh, the, uh, the tide of millennium and enter the 2000s, two towering personalities of uh, uh, Wahhabi Islam, Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, they both die. And there is a vacuum within theology, uh, within the official religious establishment of Saudi Arabia. And there still, till this day, has not been a person of that caliber who has replaced them, which, uh, regardless of whatever uh, political position uh, he supports, of course, uh, the government <coughs> position, but uh, regardless of that, people generally respect uh, that personali personality. Which, uh, so the attitude which developed, which Dr. Al-Rashid uh, describes as, uh, in as uh, institution apologetic institutional religious discourse. So it was apologetic, it was inst institutionalized, and it was also uh, religious discourse. So, so this, this, this shows that there was certain uh, vacuum in the religious field, which uh, could have been only fulfilled by the Safwa people who, were, who definitely had that uh, uh, esteem as theologians and people ref came towards them, asked about different issues. I mean, just sideline politics for a second. And uh, we see in 2002, I guess, uh, Prince Naif, the father of uh, former Crown Prince Mohammed, Prince Mohammed bin Naif, he said that uh, we did everything for Muslim Brotherhood, and yet how they return uh, all these favors? They have uh, been corrupting our youth. So this narrative was very much within the Saudi circles, and you have to bear in mind, this was not the time of uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. It was the narrative in the older generation. And gradually that narrative strengthened um, and, and we see that uh, this is the mindset in which the Saudi ruling elite has uh, progressed. And on the other hand, of course, Qatar was, as Professor Andrews also mentioned, was a totally different uh, project. Interestingly, the Saudis are very critical about, uh, are now very critical about uh, Qatar's proposed links with Iran, but they had their own 10-year uh, kind of rapprochement process uh, with Iran, in which they actively engage with the Iranians and try to come uh, come to an understanding on certain points, uh, but that failed. So then came the Arab Spring, and during the Arab Spring, I will put again the words of uh, Professor Andreas said like there was a realization that we can actually do something now. So that neoliberal model changed into a neo-realist one, and uh, Qatar actively became a regional power. And of course, the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, uh, the rising trend in the region. Uh, and realistically, for, uh, to, in order to capitalize that, Qatar um, uh, facilitated these actors. And it is also interesting that in Syria, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, they were all on the same plane. Um, and also, uh, in uh, Yemen, uh, both were relatively following the same positions, although there were some differences. But gradually, the Saudis realized that uh, all these new states uh, which have been affected by Arab Spring and which, uh, can now, which are now proponents of the new political order, they are essentially uh, under the domain of political Islam or political Islamists uh, are in power within these states. And this kind of, um, there was a general realization within the Saudis and, uh, of course, the Amaratis to counter this project. So Egypt was the first episode. And I personally think the second episode was the first crisis of uh, uh, GCC, the 2014 crisis. Um, what happened in that crisis? Of course, there, it's kind of similar and also not similar. Ambassadors were recalled. 
but channels of communication they were open. Even um, uh, Qatari Amir, uh, Amir Tamim, he met uh, King Abdullah as well. And we also have to see that uh, there was uh, uh, this, this notion of uh, differing perceptions of the scene makers and their own agency. So King Abdullah had a more careful and calculated uh, uh, manner of doing things. And he eventually uh, thought that, okay, uh, there can be an understanding, so let's the new Amir uh, work with us and we can gradually see how things uh, can um, get better between, uh, uh, between the Gulf nations. Now come the most interesting part, the death of King Abdullah and the ascension of King Salman. And the first person King Salman removes is um, uh, the, the head of Saudi royal court, Khalid al-Tijari. Khalid al-Tijari was uh, uh, essentially connected with uh, Prince Muhammad bin Zayed, and he was the sort of uh, interlocutor between Prince Muhammad bin Zayed in Amarath and uh, King Abdullah. So essentially, Prince Muhammad bin Zayed lost uh, very important person uh, in the shape of Khalid al Jerry, And we also see that the relationship between the Qatari royals at that time and the Saudi royals were very cordial. We see there was uh, active cooperation within Syria. Rebels uh, won victories on the battlefield. Uh, there was cooperation in terms of Yemen. Um, Qatar openly supported the Saudi intervention in Yemen. So there, it seems that uh, both uh, royal families were going uh, quite good at that time. Uh, the first, uh, uh, after the ascension, Prince Mohammed bin Naif, he was the first person to visit Qatar, actually. So, what changed this? I think the change, uh, of course, uh, the influence of Prince Mohammed bin Zayed is very much there. But there are certain local uh, de denominators within Saudi Arabia that uh, cannot be disregarded when we see this, this policy orientation towards Qatar. One uh, aspect is that uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, other than economic transformation or so social liberalization, he has a vision which kind of uh, conforms with the vision of uh, Prince Mohammed bin Zayed that Saudi youth should be depoliticized. So in order to depoliticize Saudi youth, who can be the, the potential political actors? The only potential political actors uh, who had that much influence in Saudi society that they can create a lot of mobilization were, of course, the Safa people, political Islamists. So you had to deal with that issue. And in that manner, but in a manner that the issue doesn't play as a domestic issue, but as an issue of national security. So we see that uh, when the second Gulf crisis happens, um, in the aftermath, there were many casualties. I mean, we see that uh, in a more nation state manner interaction of Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia, but within Saudi Arabia there were many casualties. Uh, we will come towards the casualties afterwards, but first see like how this happened, what was uh, the, at the back end. So Prince Mohammed bin Salman wanted to consolidate his rule and he definitely has some competitors within the royal family. And this could never have been possible without American uh, active approval. And he didn't have any connections with the with Washington at that time because he was a new entity in the town. So through that was the very period where Mohammed bin Zayed came in and his uh, most influential um, ambassador in the United States, uh, Yusuf al Atebai, played this role. And we see that the Amarati is facilitating uh, um, contacts between President Trump, uh, President Trump after he got elected but before his oath and the Russians. So there was a kind of a repertoire which was developed between um, uh, President Trump and Mohammed bin Zayed. And then in that um, uh, whole thing entered uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So once the American backing was there, uh, they gradually rolled over against different uh, opponents. I mean, just uh, after this, uh, the Gulf crisis started, the next casualty was, uh, or the next person who was rolled back was Prince Mohammed bin Naif. He was removed and Prince Mohammed bin Salman was made uh, the crown prince. Who were the next persons? Uh, the political Islamists were the next people who were arrested. And it was uh, the Saudi press agency released a statement that uh, uh, they had been working for foreign agents with uh, a veiled indication toward Qatar. So essentially, uh, an issue which had very domestic co connotations 
was framed in a national security manner. So I will put bluntly that uh, those Sokhwa people were, uh, they were just dumped by the, under the Qatari bus. Just like before when there was any protest in the eastern province, they, uh, that protest was framed uh, with its links with Iran. So all these happenings, we can, we can see that there, is a, uh, there are connections between what Saudi Arabia uh, has been projecting in its foreign policy with the local dynamics within Saudi Arabia. And uh, the depoliticization project uh, is more or less going right. Uh, is working for Mohammed bin Salman, but it is working for now uh, because uh, youth and certain other sections of society, certain liberal sections of society, have um, uh, they, they think that uh, maybe he can deliver and there can be a prospect of uh, transformation within Saudi Arabia. Because we must, we, we should be very clear in this that no, nobody. Uh, kind of wants to sustain the older Saudi Arabia. Nobody absolutely has any sympathy for the retained princes. Um, yes, uh, there can be issues about uh, regulation, about uh, um, transparency, but uh, corruption or this, this sort of governance was the very norm. So I think this issue will m play on under the under the impact of the personal agency of uh, Mohammed bin Salman and of course Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, and uh, there doesn't look to be a very uh, amicable solution till now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Karim. Uh, we don't have much time, but we have to give the floor for questions and comments. And the distinguished participants should give their comments and ask their questions. Try your best to be as brief as you can. And to whom you direct your question? Thank you. Uh, very much indeed, President of the session. I have a comment before my question. The comment is for Dr. Dafar al Ajme and Dr. Abdullah Abu Abud. Don't you agree with me that, first, the comment is that, uh, Dr. Abdullah, don't you agree with me that the Omani diplomacy now passes through a very difficult uh, test after Yemeni test? although that this test is relatively different because we talk about members of same uh, organization. But Oman now got used to these situations, and now it is also, it's always described that it has uh, various situ uh, uh, directions towards the crisis. We have a difficult time because they usually ask us for a clear-cut situation towards the crisis. Our problem is with classification. What do we mean by such classification is that that we have a direct neighbor with whom we have historical relations, which is UEE. We have a strong economic relations. We have also very social relations, very deep with UAE other than other Gulf states. So I would like uh, the rest of the Arab uh, countries that follow up with this crisis that the declaration of the situation is not that easy for the Omani and the Omani diplomacy. This is the comment. The question now, don't you agree, don't you think, Dr. Gathwir and Dr. Advalla, that without diplomacy, I know that you were over diplomatic and Dr. Dafer, you don't you think that the Kuwaiti and the Omani situations are very close to the Qatari situation, although that they have not declared that we know that this is foreign diplomacy, usually do not declare uh, their actual state. So for me, I read the current situation that both Oman and Turk and uh, Qatar are uh, both Oman and Kuwait are very closer to Qatari opinion more than the other four blockading countries. This is one question. For the other question is, what is your perception or understanding in your capacity as professors of international relations to have international relations in the area? We, as people uh, of the area, 
are usually required to read and keep silent and uh, don't give any comments. And when we just saw our situation, we should have different rules of international relations that give us the freedom to express our opinion without being classified just to, to be uh, uh, taken as analysts, as academic people or as scientists. I wish that we should have some recommendations in this regard because if dispute is over today, we will have other disputes after 10 years. The last comment, Doctor, I have some conservation on uh, making uh, the media responsible for this political, uh, this political unbelievable attitude. We think that this political attitude is not totally responsible for it is the media. We have other types of media. We don't have independent media that is responsible for this crisis. We have media that is followers. Media people are followers. Please do not make the media responsible for this crisis because the media are followers, not as leaders. Another question. My question is very simple for Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Dafir. Part of the Gulf, uh, current Gulf crisis is the failure of the GCC to turn into effective organization. GCC was better than the Arab League. However, its institutions were not effectuated. For example, the Committee for Dispute Resolutions, it has its articles of associ associations. Can we look after the end of this crisis to turn into GCC into more actual effective organization to solve actual disputes on the ground, regardless of that it follows the Supreme Council regardless? Um, yes, I, I asked this question in the last panel, but no one answered it, so I'm going to ask it again. Um, uh, what scenarios do you think uh, would play out in the event that the Saudi regime collapsed? Um, and what do you think your respective government policies would be? Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to ask one question to Andreas, uh, that we have not been paying much attention on the kind of political transform, economic transformation which is taking place in the entire region. And especially in Saudi Arabia has decided to diversify its economy in, in, at, at very large scale. So, there are two parallel processes which are going on. One is that the economic diversification, which is very fundamental for Saudi Arabia, sustainable, sustainability and its survival for a long time. And second is the regional crisis in which Iran has uh, come in, uh, very deeper into the Saudi security uh, sensitivities. So how do you uh, relate the, the political economy of the region and of Saudi Arabia especially uh, responsible for the, this crisis? In, in my understanding, what I uh, think that Saudi Arabia will again come back to the position where it, what it used to be during the Fahd uh, uh, regime. So it cannot continue for a long time uh, such kind of crisis with Qatar or any other state, in my understanding. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. So uh, as all eyes are focused on the upcoming uh, summit in Kuwait, my question is, uh, w what comes next? I understand that we don't have a, a crystal ball to, to, to figure out how it will evolve. But uh, look, if we look at the GCC countries, it seems what initially looked as a big six uh, with, Qatari uh, with Kuwait, uh, Qatari crisis evolved itself to, to big five. Now we have that uh, actually there's a three plus one Saudi less coalition and newly imagined duo of uh, uh, Oman and Kuwait, which trying to mediate. So there's a big split inside. So my question is, since this is a critical test for GCC countries, won't we have out of these numbers one big zero if uh, the efforts to mediate collapse and this will come as the last nail in the coffin of the GCC? Thank you. I have two questions on brief. My first speaker for the Arab speakers, it is clear 
that the recent crisis whether uh, resulted from sheikhs or individuals. You think that the work institutions or the organization are not part of decision makers. So what is your understanding of the development of such relations between the presidents, people of the nations and work organizations? For how long <coughs> such decisions will be only taken by certain people in the area? And the second question is... I, I like your paper. And uh, I mean, taking all into consideration, I mean, and uh, the, the level of uncertainty, I mean, wh where do you see the Gulf state in two to three years, looking to the MBS, MBZ, and Qatar? And uh, particularly also looking to the, to the development in the oil price, the ultimate source of income for those uh, economies. Thank you. Yesterday, we listened to the word of the speech of His Highness Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, and he mentioned uh, his opinion or a phrase that what happens now in the Gulf in this recent crisis will be extremely difficult to restore trust even uh, and I hope even if it will be not easy not to restore trust because feeling and relations uh, to restore them as they used to be before the blockade. Dr. Aboud also talked about the concept of gradual, gradual solutions or graduality uh, and in achieving the unity. Taking the current situation into uh, our minds and uh, based on the recent crisis and what His Highness uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs said, how do you see the future of GCC if we take all these factors into consideration? Now we'll give the floor for uh, the participants, the panelists, to we'll start with Dr. Duffer because he has to leave uh, to catch his flight. My flight is at 4 o'clock, so that's why I will... Are we closer to Qatar than other uh, countries? No. <coughs> We work on a plateau. We are in the same distance from all uh, parts of the crisis, but the high level or high ceiling of freedom may, might make you feel that there is contradicting parties. If you watch uh, the Kuwaiti TV or media, you'll see that some commentators and announcers agree with this opinion or that um, situation. So we would like uh, the, the political decision makers and uh, uh, Kuwaiti streets are neutral. We should have upgrades. The external risk is what uh, creates GCC. The internal uh, risks will develop the GCC. As for the media, I think the media is the main source of evil. It was the main reason for escalating the crisis. It was the main reason for uh, they have taken this as a pretext to prove their patriotism and nationalism by calling names of the other parties. So it wasn't mature enough and it wasn't qualified enough to deal with such a crisis. Does GCC fail? I don't think so. The problem with GCC is that there, is a, there are a lot of issues that you don't see for the normal uh, citizen. The GCC is not only social or political or, uh, uh, or economic one, it's also a military one. And the normal people do not see all the aspects of the GCCs. We have a lot of military cooperation between us to the extent that, that NATO, is, NATO is what unifies Europe and the same. Uh, Al Jazeera Shield is the one that unifies the GCCs. I'm talking to you and I know the two parts of the conflict or the crisis are in the same hall, uh, military people handling and doing the same thing for the benefits of the GCC as a whole. So I don't think that GCC failed and the monitor just sees might be there is a lack or absence of set a committee for uh, mediation or solving the current access or uh, uh, dispute resolution committee the collapse of saudi arabia i see the decline of the western civilization closer than the fall of saudi arabia i see uh, uh, trump is repeating uh, gorbachev 
scenario more than I see the collapse of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Turkish uh, being here uh, is part of uh, a military cooperation, so I cannot, I don't have the right to judge what's going on between Turkey and uh, Qatar. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abdullah. Um, أنا أعتقد إنه غيارا للموقف الكويتي أعتقد أن يعني هذا قراءتي الشخصية. This is my personal reading to the situation. The Omani situation is quite close to the Qatari situation. Oman wants to be impartial, but we understand more the situation of Qatar rather than understanding the blockade and the boycott. Oman has tried a lot to be impartial and to gain credibility in this connection. Media is uh, related to politics and both are not doing a good job. And uh, I think at the same time that Dr. Dakar has added to this point, I think we have a problem. We have a big institutional problem in this connection. We need to remember always that the Gulf countries live in the 21st century, but I'm sorry to say that they are governed through thoughts of the Middle Ages, the institutions are not there and are not doing the necessary jobs. There is no a decision that is taken collectively. All the decisions are taken individually and according to the mood. And as long as we have this in our region, we will go from a problem to another problem and we cannot solve immediately our problems because the peoples are way behind, the institutions are not given uh, the opportunity to work properly and there is a sort of authoritarian in, in, when it comes to power and the rule of the individual is always surrounded by mistakes. We have now young rulers in the region and uh, we ask Allah Almighty to help the region so as not to go back to the Dahas and Ghabra war of the Middle Ages and we need not to go into dispute that will only benefit the enemies. GCC can be blamed all the time, but I think the GCC has uh, uh, positive and negative sides. The same with any regional organization. We don't expect much from the GCC, but the GCC has achieved certain things. We need to keep the GCC, we need to develop the GCC. In the GCC we have a sort of an arbitration, but this uh, unit is not vital, is not working. But on the other hand, uh, the European Union that we consider it a model, we have the European Court of Justice, when any disputes that are related to the European Union, the things are to be reviewed by the court. We don't believe in the court. We don't believe in the consultative authority. We don't believe in anything. The laws are there taken by individuals and approved by individuals. Even if the decision is taken outside the mechanism of the GCC, this shows to everyone that even some leaders are not quite keen about the points that we are interested in. I think the Turkish force in the unit, and I think the American base also has or have a big role so as not uh, to give the Rokhani countries a chance to storm Qatar. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, big Turkish 
the units by I think the Americans at the Pentagon have pointed strongly to red lines that must not be crossed. Yes, I can stop here. We don't have enough time. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. Um, yes, I to start off with the the Turkish, the role of the Turkish forces. I think I agree. I completely agree with uh, what uh, Abdullah said. I think it's a very small component, and they were just in the process of building up at the time when the crisis happened. Um, we, but to talk about the military option, as much as you know, in the media where people are saying this was just a joke, it would would have never happened. Um, there are plans in, in the UAE for a military invasion of Qatar as early as 2014. And we've, been, we've seen a lot of aggression. I'm not going to go into the details, but I was still working for the military here in 2014 that we've seen from the Emiratis. So um, I think the, the Emirates would have been more ready had there not been an American base. And I think that's the, that's the absolute, Aludate is the absolute savior for, for the countries, and they do know that. Um, but beyond Aludate, I think we have to bear in mind that um, both the State Department and the Defense Department of the United States have taken a key role in supporting, uh, of not supporting the countries, but at least drawing clear lines of that couldn't have been, couldn't be crossed, could be crossed, couldn't be crossed um, by either the Saudis or the Emiratis. And at the same time, Donald Trump was, in his uh, vision, contained by these two Mattis and uh, Mattis and Tillerson, who are both know the country well. Mattis has been here as a military officer, so he understands, you know, the importance of Arudid, and he has a good relationship with the country armed forces. I think that is that was the key uh, factor in in pushing in, in pulling back uh, Donald Trump, who was someone who was initially quite, um, you know, not, not, not ambiguous. He was actually quite clearly on the side of Saudi and, uh, and the Emirates. And he's given some assurances during the Riyadh summit, uh, not the Riyadh summit, but, oh, yes, the Riyadh summit this year, um, to MBS and MBZ telling them, you know, go ahead, if you need to do it, do it, uh, without knowing what the consequences were. Unfortunately, we are, the United States are uh, ruled by someone who doesn't really understand the region at all. Um, in terms of, if we look at the, the, the relationship between you know political economy and and this instability that we see here, uh, I do think that this plays a very important role. And I think uh, Adafa said this, or Abdallah said this. And the, the problem of a low oil price is something that is, has definitely exacerbated the problems that we have social politically. The rentier state is not sustainable as it is in all of these countries, except for maybe Qatar. And that's because Qatar is a very small country with a very small population. But even here, Qatar had to tighten their belt on some of their of their expenditures. I think the next, if you know, I'm, I'm having regular meetings with the, with uh, bankers and insurance people in London, and you know, we're, we're talking about the the economic futures of the region. Oman is very close to default, and I think there is a, there's a huge problem there if they don't reform it. And the problem here is the lack of leadership to actually make these reforms because there's this, you know, the the, the situation where you don't know where what is going to come next. The ministries can't really push through anything anything new because there is a stalemate within within Muscat. Um, there's a problem in. Kuwait is not that bad. Bahrain is bankrupt if it wasn't for, you know, for Saudi bailouts. The Saudis don't have the money to bail them out. The countries wanted to bail out the, the Bahrainis, actually. There were negotiations in May to give them money to bail them out. Um, and that just suggests to us that at that point, the Bahrainis didn't know that what was coming. They weren't part in the picture. Um, and then obviously the crisis happened. The Saudis are the biggest problem. The Saudis, and this is the big question mark, and everybody's worried about it. Everybody in the financial world is worried about Saudi Arabia. So now it's about building trust for, for investors. But let's put it that way. Nobody knows how much money was seized over the last couple of weeks. But it, let it be 500 to 800 billion dollars, which is a ridiculous amount of money. These, this money is not being used to, because the problem in Saudi is not, it's not that there is no money, but the money is not properly redistributed to the people. There is no social justice at all. Now, the money that is being generated now through all these arrests cannot be, will not be put to the people or to social programs because they're there to actually fill the holes in the budget. The budget looks like a Swiss cheese. It's full of holes. And there's a huge problem with that. The Yemeni war is very expensive, and that's why they need to get out of it. They need to get out of it. Um, the, the spending that is, that is happening is way beyond what the, the income is. And the IMF just clearly said, you know, if they don't do it in three years, they'll be bankrupt. Uh, and, and that is a huge problem because, and that's why there are radical measures being taken and they need to be taken in Saudi Arabia. The question is just whether he can deliver on the promises that he made to the young people. Right, um, just a quick thing about the GCC summit. You know His Highness the Emir is gonna attend. The King of Saudi Arabia is gonna t going to attend. Um, 
Gargash is going to attend, which means I think he's going to be the most senior guy coming from the Emirates, um, which shows us the dynamic that we will see in Kuwait is going to be... Sir? Gargash. Yeah, that's what, he, what they just confirmed now. I just saw a couple of minutes the ago. The most senior? The most senior, apparently. Which kind of suggests that, you know, there's not going to be any major breakthrough. And sing, sending King Salman and not MBS means you're actually sending a figurehead rather than a decision maker. So, you know, King Salman is not in the state to, have to lead any negotiations with his highness. He is pretty much a, you know, an old man that is being, being shipped there. So um, I'm, I'm, not very, um, I'm not very optimistic about what's going to come out of Kuwait. But let's say, inshallah, it's going to happen. Hello. Hello. Talk about uh, the question which was raised uh, okay. about uh, the uh, like uh, the downfall of the Saudi regime. I think uh, our senior academics are sitting here. A uh, very respected uh, academic who has written a full book on the subject, and another very respected academic. I mean, they're very wonderful people. They also, kind of predicted, but both predictions uh, they they they. The, the, uh, they turned out to be uh, not uh, correct. And since there is also this thing that uh, rather than predicting it will go down or not, it's a country in transition. Many things are not clear at all. How it will play out, what will happen, uh, what will be the, the form of institutions, what will be the new power uh, sharing agreement between um, people and uh, uh, elites, what will be the new social contract. So unless we don't have clarity about these things, uh, I think for now, by this massive PR campaign, which as all, all the panelists correctly relate, uh, said that PR, these PR agencies and some media outlets, they are kind of uh, a problem in themselves. They have projected this to the Saudi, the Saudi populace that uh, they, can, uh, uh, they can hope for some uh, fruits uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, but it, a lot of uh, it depends on what uh, MBS can deliver and what he won't be able to deliver. I mean, on a positive note, at least there is some change happening. He is, is trying to do something different. Uh, I don't think uh, Prince Mohammed bin Naif would have been doing uh, uh, something different. Uh, if the old model would have been going on, uh, things would have been different. So now this new model is there, so we have to see how this model goal and how, because there is a lot of bureaucratization happening within Saudi Arabia as well now. Uh, so new structures of power, new forms of governance, they are appearing. Uh, how will they mature? Will they work or not? So we have to keep all these things in context in order to give a, a more broader picture. Thank you very much for the participants and thank you very much you all for being here today. Sorry, we have taken a lot of your time, but I hope the spiritual side will be okay. We wish you a healthy and delicious lunch. Thank you.